Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. For our main topic today, we'll be talking about the rules regarding fuel gauge accuracy. Plus, we've got an interesting wrinkle when flying a missed approach following an IFR visual approach. Plus, listener stories from you about close calls you've had while flying. Last week in episode 168, in our safety moment with Rob Mark, we talked about how to avoid deadly weather-related accidents. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And if the Aviation News Talk podcast is new to you, in whatever app you're using to listen to us now, just click on that subscribe button so that new episodes will download for free each week. I think you'll enjoy today's discussion about fuel gauges, and you won't want to miss future shows. This week in the news, Eclipse Aviation has been sold while in bankruptcy. New aircraft sales this year are mostly down, though piston sales are up. And a UAV pilot may be going to jail. All this and more, and the news starts now. From Law360.com, One Aviation's $5 million Chapter 11 sale is okayed. Now, the company name One Aviation might not be familiar to you, so let me give you a brief history. You probably recall that Eclipse Aviation, founded back in 1998, burned through over a billion dollars to produce the Eclipse 500 Very Light Jet. And according to a recent AvWeb article, quote, Eclipse claimed to have as many as 2,500 orders and planned to produce 1,000 airplanes a year, some 1,400 ordered by Dayjet, a budding on-demand air taxi idea that also went belly up. Now, fewer than 300 Eclipse aircraft were ever built before the company entered bankruptcy. Total company liabilities were estimated at over $1 billion. In 2009, after a lengthy Chapter 7 process, the company was sold for $20 million in cash and $20 million in new promissory notes. And by the way, while researching this, I learned that the federal bankruptcy court judge who approved that sale was Mary Walrath, who grew up down the street from me in my hometown of Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. Going forward in 2015, the new Eclipse Aerospace merged with Kestrel Aircraft to form One Aviation. You may recall that Kestrel was founded by Alan Klapmeyer, the former CEO and co-founder of Cirrus, to build the Kestrel K350 turboprop, which never made it to market. One Aviation has struggled financially in last week on November 20th, according to an article in Law360.com. A Delaware judge on Friday gave his nod to the roughly $5 million sale of One Aviation's assets in a difficult Chapter 11 case that included prior failed attempts at a sale despite opposition from other potential buyers. One Aviation Corporation filed for Chapter 11 with roughly $198 million in debt in October 2018, initially proposing a restructuring and debt for equity swap. During Friday's hearing, the judge also gave his nod to a limited sale of certain of One Aviation's assets for $225,000 to Nautical Hero. Now, it's unclear which assets those were, though it's possibly the Kestrel K350, which could have been sold off separately. Nautical Hero Group appears to be a new company that was just formed in August. So, in summary, Eclipse, which spent over a billion dollars, was first sold for $40 million, and has now been sold again for $5 million, which goes to show you that sometimes old aviation companies never die. They're just sold again and again, and unfortunately for pennies on the dollar. From SkiesMag.com, Gamma publishes Q3 2020 aircraft shipments and billing report. The General Aviation Manufacturers Association, Gamma, released its report of GA aircraft shipments and billings through the third quarter of 2020. Piston airplane deliveries increased slightly, while turboprop, business jet, and helicopter deliveries declined through the first nine months of 2020 as compared to 2019. Gamma President and CEO Pete Bunt said, This latest shipment report gives insight into how the industry is faring after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. While we are still trailing in comparison to last year's figures due to a virus-impacted second quarter, it is encouraging to see deliveries in certain segments have rebounded. It's also worth noting that this is the first quarter in history where we are reporting certified electric aircraft deliveries. Well, that's a pretty big change. Airplane shipments through the first nine months of 2020 when compared to the same period in 2019 saw piston deliveries increase 1.4% with 889 units. Turboprop deliveries declined 27% with 254 units. And business jet deliveries declined 26% with 378 units. 
The value of aircraft delivered through the third quarter of 2020 was $11.9 billion, a decline of approximately 20%. From the Pipistrel newsletter, charging the Pipistrel Alpha Electro with sunshine. Beam conducted the world's first flying on sunshine flight in a Pipistrel production electric aircraft, powered completely by Beam's EV Arc solar-powered charging unit delivering off-grid, sustainably generated, locally stored energy. The world's first maiden flight took place at Reedley Municipal Airport in Fresno County, California, with local officials present, with pilot Joseph Oldham at the controls. Beam Global CEO Desmond Wheatley said, The electrification of transportation is taking to the skies, powered by Beam Global. With 40% of greenhouse gas emissions coming from transportation in California, it's imperative to push the envelope in every form of mobility. Whether it has two, four, or 18 wheels, a propeller, or four rotors, Beam is developing sustainable solutions to deliver clean mobility to all. The patented EV Arc 2020 is the only 100% renewable, transportable, off-grid EV charging option on the market. And I took a look at this device, and it's really fascinating. It looks like they essentially have a self-contained device that they can load up on the back of the truck, drop off in a space that's the size of a normal parking space, and this self-contained unit has solar cells on the top, batteries uh, somewhere in the unit, and it can be used to generally charge cars, but in this case, they've deployed it at an airport to charge airplanes. So it's pretty slick design. You can find out more at beamforall.com. From aopa.org, new AOPA weather available online and via AOPA app. The new AOPA weather, powered by Sirius XM Aviation, provides national and airport-specific data in a mobile-friendly format that makes it perfect for checking weather on the go, even via the AOPA app. They say that in April they debuted the iFlight Planner, which replaced the AOPA Legacy Flight Planner. In September, they upgraded the app to include AOPA Airports and Destinations Directory. And in November, they announced the consolidation of AOPA Go into the AOPA app. And now in another enhancement, AOPA members can access the new mobile-friendly AOPA weather and iFlight planner for AOPA via the AOPA app, as long as you're connected to the internet. AOPA weather pulls in your home and favorite airports from your settings in the AOPA airports and destination directory, but you can also set your home and favorites from AOPA weather by clicking on the home and heart icons within the METAR and TAF details for an airport. You can also get radar, satellite, wind, stream, surface winds, and surface analysis charts in the current weather layers and the current weather charts section. In the forecast sections, you can choose among the surface forecast, airmets, or airmets. And of course, you can find out more at aopa.org. From Flying Magazine at flyingmag.com, a current study on PIREPS needs pilot input. Pegasus looks at the use and future of pilot reports in flight. Pegasus is not just another aviation weather acronym. It stands for the Partnership to Enhance General Aviation Safety, Accessibility, and Sustainability. And they have a number of projects, including Project 33, the Advanced Weather Information Project, or AWIP, A-W-I-P. And one of its goals is to increase the use, quality, and reliability of PIREPs, which of course are pilot reports, of weather conditions experienced throughout flight. According to the Pegasus website, the use of augmented reality to drive three-dimensional visualization of cloud formations, particularly in convective environments, should help pilots to understand and mitigate the challenges associated with flying in these environments. Flying Magazine spoke with Mel Futrell, a California-based pilot working with the FAA via Purdue University, on a variety of projects under the Pegasus umbrella. We have a current study concerning technology and PIREP use and behavior, and I have a survey to query the GA public to this effect. The data will be used to understand how to improve the ability of pilots to collect and process weather data. And it says, please consider participating in an online survey on PIREPS, and we'll include the link to that survey in our show notes. The survey, they say, takes approximately 10 minutes. The Florida Institute of Technology and Purdue University appreciate as many pilots as possible participating in the survey between now and the end of November 2020, so you need to jump on that quickly. And by the way, the name Mel Futrell is familiar to me. I met her several years ago at Air Venture, where she hosts a radio show on EAA Radio and goes by the name of Magneto Mel. From KESQ.com, plane crash survivor shares his story. Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, story. 16-year-old Reef Hogan 
was on a flight with his father and flight instructor that took off from Helena Regional Airport back on July 30th on a flight to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Less than an hour later after takeoff, their Cessna 337 Skymaster spiraled into the mountains near Ennis Lake. The impact cracked the plane open, stranding the three passengers. I can remember everything, Reeves said. Although both he and the flight instructor survived, neither was in any condition to trek through the forest. Unfortunately, his father, Brandon Hogan, died shortly after the crash, but his cell phone ensured that his son would survive. Looking through his father's flight bag, he found the phone. With just 9% left on its battery life, he managed to reach a Madison County dispatcher. After five hours, Reef was in the air again in a basket dropped by a Life Flight helicopter. He said, they don't warn you how dizzy you can get in one of those. To treat his injuries, staff in the Bozeman emergency room cut through the flight suit Reef was wearing, which was his father's flight suit, that he wore to keep warm after the crash. The flight suit, along with everything in it, went into a plastic bag. That plastic bag went into a landfill. Those treating Reef didn't realize that they had thrown away a piece of Reef's father and that his son had wanted to keep his father's Rolex watch, which he had placed in the flight suit. When Reef woke up from spinal surgery, he asked Dr. Ben Smith what happened to his flight suit, his wallet, and his father's watch. Smith, whose own father died when he was in eighth grade, looked through Reef's room then he made calls to search through the crash site and the helicopter that brought Reef to Bozeman. When I heard, we think it may have gone out with a trash, before I knew it, I was driving faster than I probably should to the dump, Smith said. With family members and a hospital staff member, Smith plucked through mounds of trash at a local dump for several hours. A safety officer helped guide their search while another employee operated a plow. About 10 feet deep into a pile of garbage, Smith said he spotted the flight suit. He felt something heavy inside the left breast pocket. That was more gratifying than any surgery I've ever done, Smith said. A video posted to Facebook by Reef's mother, Kelly Hogan, showed Smith handling the Rolex to him while he laid in a hospital bed. He also held the bag containing the ripped and bloody flight suit. Although he needed a walker to attend high school classes three days a week since coming to Billings, Reef has since transitioned to a wooden cane. He said he should be physically recovered by July of next year, and he should also be back in the cockpit. After testing out of high school, Reef said he'll enroll in the aviation program at Rocky Mountain College to continue his ambition of becoming a pilot. I want to go back up to their hangar and visit sometime. There's a special feeling about being in a hangar. It's just comfortable. I want my own airplane, a little runway, and a tiny house with a hangar, Reef said. In following his father's passion for flying, Reef will become a fourth-generation pilot, and we wish him luck in his flying career. From generalaviationnews.com come... Two stories of recent NTSB reports. This first one says plane crashes after student tries to pass on the taxiway. The student pilot in the low-wing Piper PA-28 reported that after landing at the airport in Miami, Florida, she exited the runway onto a taxiway, which was occupied by a high-wing airplane that had landed before her. She attempted to pass the high-wing aircraft on the left, but her right wing hit the other airplane's left-wing lift strut. Her airplane then turned right about 180 degrees, and the right wing struck the propeller and then the right wing of the high-wing airplane. The CFI and the high-wing airplane reported that after exiting the runway onto a taxiway, he felt a small hit on the left side. He saw a low-wing airplane make a right 180 around the front of his airplane and hit its right wing. Both airplanes sustained substantial damage to the right wings. The student reported that there were no mechanical malfunctions or failures with the airplane that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, the student pilot's improper decision to taxi past another airplane occupying the taxiway and her subsequent failure to maintain clearance from the airplane. And I just want to add that I know multiple cases of pilots who have damaged their aircraft while taxiing or not done flying until the aircraft has made it back to its tie-down spot. I think so many people think that once they're done flying, that it's just like driving a car and nothing is going to happen. But you're driving a car with pretty long wings sticking out there, so make sure you're looking out both sides and be very careful about passing other aircraft while taxiing. Most taxiways are really meant for one aircraft going in one direction. And another NTSB report from generalaviationnews.com, flying with an aircast boot leads to loss of directional control. The pilot reported that he was flying the airplane while wearing an aircast boot during landing to the airport in Rock Hill, South Carolina. The Aerostar 601 decelerated and he asked the passenger to move his feet up to the brake pedals and apply the brakes. He added that the passenger applied insufficient differential brake application and the airplane veered left. The passenger applied right brake and rudder to correct, but the plane then veered right, exited the runway to hit a ditch. The airplane sustained substantial damage to the right wing. 
The pilot reported that he was wearing the boot due to a previous injury. He added that he had the ability to fully manipulate both rudder controls, but the boot prevented him from being able to fully apply brake pressure. The pilot reported that there was no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the airplane that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause? The pilot's improper decision to fly with an aircast boot on his foot, which led him to rely on the passenger to apply brakes and rudder, which was performed improperly and led to loss of directional control. And from SciPost, that's PSYPost.org, neuroscience study suggests that pilots display a unique pattern of brain functional connectivity. And yes, I think that most spouses think that their pilot spouse's brains are wired a little bit differently, but now we have proof of it. It says pilots display a different pattern of functional connectivity in the brain according to a new research conducted in China. The new studies examined interactions and synchronized activity between different areas of the brain, and the findings suggest that pilots tend to have enhanced cognitive flexibility compared to their non-flying counterparts. Quote, civil aviation is a distinctive career. Pilots work in a complex, dynamic information environment. They must be aware of all the relevant information regarding this environment and recognize their meaning and importance, said the authors of the new research in an article published in PLOS One. Because of the cognitive demands placed on pilots, the researchers hypothesized that they would display a different pattern of brain connectivity compared to non-pilots. The researchers used resting state functional MRI, a widely used tool for investigating spontaneous brain activity, to examine the important neurocognitive networks in 26 pilots and 24 non-flying individuals who had a similar level of education. Fourteen of the pilots were flight instructors from the Civil Aviation Flight University of China, while 12 pilots were first officers at airlines. Compared to the control group, the pilots exhibited decreased functional connectivity within the central executive network and enhanced functional connections between the central executive network, salience network, and default mode network. In a similar study published in Frontiers in Neuroscience, researchers found that pilots also exhibited increased resting state functional connectivity within the default mode network. The network has been referred to as the brain's autopilot, because of its link to mind-wandering and self-referential thought. It also appears to play an important role in switching between cognitive tasks. Quote, Pilots are always working in complex dynamic environments. Flying is not now so much a physical job, but a high-level cognitive activity. The pilot should be completely aware of all conditions in real time and be ready to deal with various potential emergencies, the researchers explain. And so I, I got to tell you, I don't really know what all of this means other than, yep, we have proof now. Our brains are different. And finally, from CBS affiliate in Los Angeles, Hollywood man arrested for crashing drone into LAPD chopper. A Hollywood man was arrested last week on federal charges that he operated a drone which slammed into an LAPD helicopter back in September, forcing it to make an emergency landing. Andre Hernandez, 22, was arrested by FBI agents on one count of unsafe operation of an unmanned aircraft. Authorities say it's the first criminal case in the nation in which a person has been charged with unsafely operating a drone. In the early morning hours of September 18th, an LAPD helicopter was responding to a burglary call at Hollywood Pharmacy when it was struck by a drone, forcing the pilot to make an emergency landing. The collision damaged the chopper's nose, antenna, and bottom cowlings, prosecutors alleged in a criminal complaint. If the drone had struck the helicopter's main rotor instead of the fuselage, it could have brought the helicopter down, the criminal complaint reads. After striking the chopper, the drone fell to the ground at another residence nearby to Hernandez's home. It also damaged a vehicle, and pieces of it were found by LAPD officers near the pharmacy. Investigators reviewed the drone's camera and SD card to identify Hernandez as its owner. In late October, FBI agents raided Hernandez's home, during which he admitted that on the morning of the incident, he had heard approaching sirens and decided to fly the drone to see what was going on, prosecutors said. And in a separate article from NBC News in Los Angeles, it says the unsafe operation of an unmanned aircraft offense alleged in the complaint is a misdemeanor offense that carries a sentence of up to a year in federal prison, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, my weekly updates. And after that, we'll get on to our main topic, which is the accuracy of fuel gauges. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast.
Now here's another fun flying destination. Hi, Max. Jackson from Minnesota for another set of airports worth a visit. Today, I would like to recommend two airports that are about as far north as you can go in Minnesota. First, just for the experience, is Piney Creek Airport. Airport identifier is 48 Yankee. This airport, along with a tiny handful of others, is in both Canada and the USA. If you're landing on runway 15, your downwind leg will be in Canada and you will taxi into the United States. Going the other way, you will be back taxiing through Canada. For destinations so far to the north, their gas is surprisingly cheap. From numerous internet posts about the airport, I would recommend that you stop at Rosso Airport, Kilo Romeo Oscar X-Ray, and call the U.S. Border Patrol ahead of landing. Apparently, they are suspicious of planes landing here. Their number, 218-463-1952. As I've been told, better a bored and uninterested border guard than an excited and suspicious border guard. After you take off from Piney Creek, you can go to a much more friendly treatment by following the Rainy River East on the south side of the river until you run into the International Falls Airport. Airport identifier, Kilo, India, November, Lima. The FBO there is great. They sell canned jams and jellies from Canada. I can highly recommend the Saskatoon jam. Depending on the season, they also sell frozen walleye, so don't forget your cooler. The crew car is available, and I've heard that the area is fun to explore, but when I went, we had to leave to beat the sunset. So there you go, another fun destination in the land north of Toronto. Jackson, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And if you'd like to share your fun flying destination with the rest of us here, just go ahead and use the Voice Memos app on your phone, record about 90 seconds, and then email it to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. And here's a review. And now I don't usually uh, read reviews, but every once in a while one catches my attention. This was on Apple iTunes, and the review was from uh, the name of Amazing Five Stars. That was actually the name of the reviewer. The title was... Also, only 13, but also dream of career in aviation. And I think that's a reference to the Airplane Geeks podcast where we had someone who was 13 uh, say they listened to the show. And this review said, great podcast, also love Airplane Geeks podcast, which is where I found this. And I was thinking that's about the age 13, 14, when I got really crazy about uh, aviation and started taking flying lessons when I was 15. So anyway, great time for uh, young people to be thinking about what they want to do in the future. And certainly aviation is one of those things that you could do. And of course, another thing you could do is leave us a review in whatever app you're listening to us on now. And here's a cute meme that I saw this week that I thought I'd share with you as I thought it was kind of funny. It says, new emergency squawk code has been assigned. From now on, 7700 is no longer used. And the meme had a picture of a transponder and in it was inserted the new emergency squawk code, which was 2020. <laughs> so I think a lot of people have commented that this has been a tough year and someone's proposed that become the new emergency squawk code. So I thought that was cute. Hey, let's talk about visual approaches. This comes from boldmethod.com. I saw this earlier in the week and you may recall back in episode 166, I talked about instrument flying gotchas, including departure procedures. That was a very popular episode. So I thought you might be interested in this article, which talks about what to do if you have a go around when flying a visual approach under IFR. And I was intrigued because I didn't realize that the answer is different for a towered airport versus a non-towered airport. So if you're on an IFR flight plan and you're cleared to fly an instrument approach, you'll brief and plan to fly the published missed approach procedure on the chart. You can, of course, go missed on instrument approaches for all kinds of reasons, such as failing to make visual contact with a runway environment, conflicting traffic, you name it. Uh, but visual approaches are different because there isn't a published missed approach procedure when you're flying a visual approach under IFR. If you're flying into a towered airport and you lose contact with the runway environment, have a traffic conflict or experience wind shear, among numerous other reasons, you'll have to go around on your visual approach. You'll usually be assigned to fly runway heading at a top altitude as the first part of the missed approach. A tower controller will usually then vector you back to the final approach course or ask you to join the traffic pattern to land. And then this article on Bold Method talks about a NASA ASRS report. It says an ATP-rated corporate jet crew flying into Rifle, Colorado. Our approach to landing was smooth with light winds and no turbulence. It appeared to be an easy landing at 30 feet AGL over the landing threshold. Airspeed increased about 15 knots above VREF. And then the amber wind shear annunciator illuminated. We initiated a go-around and advised CTAF of our go-around and advised CTAF we would enter left traffic to return for a visual to runway 8. We remained on CTAF while we cleaned up the aircraft for another visual to runway 8. I contacted the aircraft following us and requested their position. 
and advise them of our intentions. I eventually made visual contact with that aircraft, which was also IFR, and extended our downwind to follow the aircraft. We made an uneventful landing. After landing and clear of the runway, we contacted ATC to cancel our flight plan. A very irate ATC individual asked what we had done and told us we were still on an IFR flight plan and we needed to contact him on our go-around. In a post-flight debrief, we both realized since we did not cancel flight plan in the air, we were technically still on an IFR flight plan. Though we were VMC at a non-towered field, our thoughts were focused on landing and not going around. Additionally, the FAA's Aeronautical Information Manual covers go-arounds from visual approaches in Section 5-4-62E. It says a visual approach is not an IAP and therefore has no missed approach segment. If a go-around is necessary for any reason, aircraft operating at controlled airports will be issued an appropriate advisory clearance instruction by the tower. At uncontrolled airports, aircraft are expected to remain clear of clouds and complete a landing as soon as possible. If a landing cannot be accomplished, the aircraft is expected to remain clear of clouds and contact ATC as soon as possible for further clearance. Separation from other IFR aircraft will be maintained under these circumstances. So there are a couple things that seem a little unusual about this. One is that normally at uncontrolled airports, until an IFR aircraft cancels their IFR clearance, no other IFR inbound aircraft are allowed in or out. So it's odd this crew had to extend their downwind to follow another IFR aircraft that was behind them. And two, it seems like the crew followed the procedure and did what the AIM said, and yet ATC chewed them out anyway. Now, the crew did note in the report that all of this could have been avoided if they had simply canceled IFR after they had the runway in sight. Of course, there's no requirement to do that, but sometimes doing that just makes things a little easier for everyone involved. So there you have it. If you go around while on a visual approach, do what the tower tells you. If you're at a non-towered airport, land as soon as possible, and if you can't land, then contact ATC. And speaking of ATC, ATC Zero is an official term used by the FAA that means they are unable to provide ATC services within the airspace managed by a specific facility. Now, in the past, these events have been relatively rare, but during the pandemic, they've occurred a little more often. About a week ago, I noticed a notum that NorCal Approach was closed for a few hours during the wee hours of the night. Now, that covers a huge area of Northern California, but apparently one of their controllers tested positive for covid so they, apparently they were doing some type of deep cleaning of the facility and were closed for a few hours. And during that time, IFR services were not available, but frankly, it was in the middle of the night, so there's very little traffic then anyway. And I noticed a story just a day or two ago in the Orange County Register, which said that a positive coronavirus test forced some John Wayne Airport air traffic controllers to quarantine. So through Sunday, there will be only two controllers working at that tower, which is a reduction from the six that typically man the tower at its busiest points during the day. So all kinds of things happening these days, so just be aware of ATC services might be a little bit constrained at some point in time near you. And here's an email that came to me from Captain Billy Hoffman. He's a doc in the Army, and he has a survey which is going on, which he's looking for people to fill out. He says, pilots face a unique barrier to seeking medical care because of the professional and social implications a new medication condition can have on their status as a pilot. For this reason, it is common knowledge in the aviation community that pilots are often adverse to seeking medical care. Interestingly, this phenomena is not well studied in the medical literature. Further, there is very little data to validate the way the FAA currently screens and assesses pilot fitness for flight. This problem is not only theoretical, a review of all aviation accidents in the United States in 2017 showed 5% of all incidents that resulted in loss of life were specifically attributed to medical conditions not disclosed to an AME. For this reason, we have set out to study this issue and advocate for evidence-based intervention to address the barriers pilots face when seeking care. We have two recently published papers on a recent study that demonstrates this barrier. We have a current study that is enrolling pilots with the objectives of generating data on specific interventions. So far, nearly 3,000 pilots have participated, and the study has been shared by United Airlines, the University of North Dakota, and Civil Air Patrol. In the coming weeks, it will be shared to pilots across the U.S. Air Force. We have multiple other studies in different phases, including one with the University of Alberta in Canada, to see how this issue differs from the U.S. So I'll include a link in the show notes where you can go take the survey, and thanks so much, Captain Hoffman, for sending this along. 
And I want to pass along congratulations to three very special people, three clients of mine who've all passed their check rides in just the last four weeks. So you can tell we've all been busy. All of these people were working with me early in the year when I suspended flight training due to the pandemic. During the summer, I started teaching in the simulator again and began working with all my instrument clients. And in early September, I began flying again with clients, though just one of them at a time, and for just the two or three weeks it took each of them to finish prepping for their check ride. So I spent the first three weeks working with a vision jet pilot to prepare him for his type rating training. And then in quick succession, I flew about two weeks each with two people working on their instrument ratings, and then for three weeks with a client finishing her private. So congratulations to Vented Rex, Isaac Wyatt, who are both now instrument rated pilots, and Estella Sue, who passed her private and has plans to become an airline pilot. Congratulations to all of you. And congratulations to a recent Patreon supporter, Nick Reinhardt, who says, Max, thanks for your show. I just soloed earlier today at 3 Mike Yankee. Thanks for all the encouragement in your show. Look forward to listening in every week. Well, you're very welcome, Nick, and congratulations to you. And here's a post from Patreon supporter Martin Miller. He says, Good morning. I just received my December issue of AOPA Pilot and saw you on the back page. Congratulations. That's like making the Aviation Centerfold well-deserved. Well, thank you so much, Martin. And yes, this is quite an honor. I think most people know that the back of AOPA, every month they feature one person, and this month it's me. <laughs> I think it's quite an honor, one that I never expected to receive, but uh, probably one of the things I'll be most proud of in my career. AOPA contacted me back in the early part of the summer and asked me if I would be interested in being featured. And then they sent a photographer out in June and shot a really awesome picture it's a Cirrus, which is centered on a yellow taxiway stripe, and then I'm standing next to the aircraft, and the stripe blurs right up to the uh, the camera lens. It's shot from a low angle, so it's really a neat photo. And it says, Max Trescott, Cirrus instructor and author, quote, it's all enjoyable. And the first uh, few lines here, it says, Max Trescott is very happy right where he is. Thank you very much. As a professional flight instructor, he has shunned the world of corporate and airline flying for something a little slower Lower and a lot more fun. Good description, by the way. His secret to making a good living as a flight instructor, a job long considered a necessary evil on the road to bigger and better things, is to focus on one area or type of aircraft. Quote, I'm a strong believer in specialization, said Trescott, the author of two books on the operation of Garmin Avionics, with a third on the way. He also hosts the popular Aviation News Talk podcast, but his primary job is flight instruction in the Cirrus SR-22 and SF-50 Vision Jet. And the article goes on. I want to thank very much uh, Ian Twombly uh, for contacting me and for writing the article. It's really great. And if you get AOPA, when you get the December issue, just turn to the back page and you'll see it there. And here's an email from a brand new Patreon supporter, Luke Claussen. Luke says, I've been flying for over 50 years, including Air Force, Airlines, Corporate, and General Aviation. I'm an active CFI and DPE. I don't think I've listened to a single podcast where I didn't find some worthwhile takeaways I appreciate your work and dedication to aviation. Well, Luke, thank you so much for those kind words and for supporting the show. And of course, if you'd like to sign up to support the show as Nick, Martin, and Luke do, this would be a really great time to do it. As we're coming up on the first of the month, that's when we always lose about a half dozen supporters because their credit cards expire. And unfortunately, most of those people don't come back to us. A few of them do. And when you sign up, I'll read your name, which will be heard literally by thousands of listeners in 140 countries around the world. If you sign up at Patreon, you can support us at different monthly levels. For example, at the $4 a month level, you'll get access to transcripts for each show. And at the $8 a month level, you'll get transcripts plus links to the many stories that were cut because we didn't have enough time to talk about them. At the $20 a month level, you'll get access to some of these shows early as well as some videos that I post for patrons. At the $35 a month level, you get access to my online courses for free. Normally, people pay for these out at pilotlearning.com. Of course, when I add new courses, you'll get access to those as well. And at the $50 a month level, after two months, I'll send you a copy of one of my books. So to support the show via Patreon, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, since you're all awesome listeners. Or you can make either a monthly donation via credit card or a one-time contribution via PayPal. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And now let me tell you about our two latest mega supporters, people who donate $50 or more or a month to the show. 
James Kerr. He is interested in buying an SR-22 for business travel, and his company makes security screens for protecting your home. You can find out more about it at bosssecuritiescreens.com. And new this week, Arel English. He's a recent CFI currently working on his double I. He and a friend have created a website to make free flight planning modern and fast. The site is called Flyway, and you can check it out yourself at flyway.cc. And we have a number of other patrons who joined us since episode 166. Catherine Cavagnaro, she added her pledge up to $35 a month. Carl Fryenmuth, Trevor Chernoff, Michael Baraz, Jay Steffenhagen, he's also at $35 a month. Jason Campbell, Anonymous, Jero Pearson, Jeff Martin added his pledge up to $20 a month. Tiffany Shiro, Luke Clausen, and John Sadie. We've also had some one-time donations through PayPal. They include Daniel Wilkins at $50. Thanks for the great podcast, he says. Martin Sachs, also $50. Alexander Sack, $25. Daniel Brown, $50. He's a new listener and a relatively new student pilot, so congratulations, Daniel. And Scott Ramsey, who's just donated $100. Thank you all so much for your donations. And here's a list of all of our mega supporters who donate $50 a month or more. Brian Deere lives in Northern California and flies a Turbo 206. Tyson Weiss, co-founder and CEO of Forflight. Bruce Dickerson, he's a financial planner in Georgia. He flies a K-35 Bonanza. Victor Vogel, who lives in Central PA and flies a Cirrus. Tim Delaney, he's a wealth manager in Santa Rosa and flies an SR-22 out of the Santa Rosa airport. Stephen Elop flies a Turbo 182 and a Citation CJ3+. He's the CEO of API Jet. Mike Williams, he's the president of Keomac and TCB Composites, which makes composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft, and he flies a 172. Seth Lake, we've had him on the show. He's a DPE giving check rides in Arkansas. He also specializes in teaching the multi-engine rating, so if you'd like to get your twin-engine rating, check out vsl.aero. Rick Miller instructs in the Cincinnati area out of the Lunkin Flight Training Center and individually with owners of Piper, Cessnas, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. He'd love to teach full-time, but still working on that day job. Justin Winter, he brokers real estate on Lake Kiowee in South Carolina, and he flies a 2019 SR-22. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Kooncat Aviation, they have two Cessna T240s, and they have a Piper M350 on order. Johnny McDade, singer, songwriter, musician, and record producer. Jim Goldfuss, he flies out of Republic Airport on Long Island. He's training for his CFI and I and teaching aviation at Pilot Proficiency International as an advanced instrument ground instructor. You can line him up for in-person teaching if you'd like online through his Facebook page at Ground Point Nine. Charles Mason flies out of Austin, working on his instrument rating in a 172. Vincent Salimi, he's council member for the city of Pinole here in California. He owns Salimi Construction Management in San Francisco. Jim Hopp is a CFI, and he teaches at Advantage Aviation at the Palo Alto Airport. Lars Litchens, our youngest supporter, flies a Redbird Simulator and someday hopes to fly his dad's Cessna 205. Dad sells boats in the western states at boulderboats.com. Joseph Sheehan flew in the Navy for eight years and now has a couple hundred hours in his vision jet. Josiah Friedman, working on his instrument rating. Dylan Caldwell, he's an AME in Florida at the Naples Municipal Airport. So if you need a basic med, second or third class flight physical, you can contact him at aviatorsclinic.com. And William Birch, he donates to the show in the memory of his son, Lieutenant J.G. Wallace Birch, who was a naval aviator. Don Hakala with Professional Instrument Courses. They conduct 10-day instrument courses, IFR finish-up, and IFR refresher courses at iflyifr.com. Stephen Bush, we've had him on the show. He's the owner of Lone Star Helicopters in Lago Vista, Texas. They do all kinds of training in helicopters, including add-on ratings. You can find them at lonestarheli.com. Don Dillman, he's a professional pilot who runs an airline flight department. He's also a CFI and flies a Bonanza. Rick Mattis, owner of PointWise, which makes CFD, computational fluid dynamics software, used by aerospace companies, and you can find them at pointwise.com. John Tosto lives in Flint, Michigan. He rents planes at the Greater Flint Pilots Association and co-owns a Cherokee 6 that's just been updated with a Garmin G3X and Garmin Autopilot. Vic Bajaj, he's a SR-22 owner here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Rick Love, based in Knoxville, he's a Cirrus CSIP, 
former Sears factory flight instructor as well, specializes in finish-up courses for instrument and commercial ratings, and he's available to help you fly home in your new Cirrus. You can reach him at ricklovecfi at gmail.com. Mark Holzbach lives in southwestern PA. He's a longtime aviation enthusiast who wants to get his private when he retires in a few years. He runs BaddenSteel.com, which manufactures industrial fasteners. Tim Crawford flies a DA-40 at Crosswinds Aviation at the Oakland County Airport north of Detroit. He runs a company called BrainSpring that helps children with dyslexia. And Greg Van, he's a senior AME at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and he's the host of the Mayo Clinic Clear Approach, which is a podcast that discusses medical issues for pilots. And we've talked about James Kerr and Arel English. And my thanks to everyone who supports the show in whatever way you do. Coming up next, we've got our main topic, which includes an interview with Tom Turner right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's talk about fuel gauges. I recently got an email from Patreon supporter Tom Turner. He's the executive director of the American Bonanza Society. And he was responding to a listener comment in episode 167 that suggested that fuel gauges can't be trusted. And Tom wrote that fuel gauges can be extremely accurate and reliable, but only if they're properly maintained. So I thought I'd invite him onto the show to talk more about fuel gauges. And here's that conversation. Now let me tell you a little bit about Tom Turner. Tom spent six years in the Air Force and was a Minuteman Missile Combat Crew Commander. Later, he earned a Master's in Aviation Safety with an emphasis on pilot training methods and human factors. He's also the Executive Director for the American Bonanza Society, and we had Tom back on way back in Episode 14. He also runs Mastery Flight Training and provides individual flight training for Beach Bonanza and Barron owners. And he was named the 2010 National FAA Safety Team Representative of the Year and was inducted into the Flight Instructor Hall of Fame in 2015. Tom, welcome back to the show. Great to have you back. Great to be back, Max. Thank you. Well, you sent me an email here a little while ago. You said you were listening to episode 167, and I think you were on the treadmill. Am I correct? Yeah, it's it's getting to the point where it gets dark early so I could spend more time in the basement listening to you. Well, I'm amazed at the number of people who uh, tell me that the podcast helps them with their exercise routine. So a lot of people doing uh, something when uh, when they're listening. Well, in episode 167, we were talking about fuel-related accidents. And you said that there's some common misperceptions that people have about fuel gauges. What are some of those misperceptions? Well, as addressed in that episode, what kind of resonated with me was the the statement that fuel gauges can't be trusted. And the discussion that you had centered on fuel starvation and fuels exhaustion events and kind of centered on the fuel indications as being uh, the unreliable fuel indications as as being a a possible cause of this, or at least certainly a contributor to the uh, mishap. And uh, it's, it's actually a misconception that fuel gauges don't have to be accurate and consequently we can dismiss them. And the reality is very different. Yeah, so tell us about some of the uh, the fuel gauge requirements for aircraft here in the U.S. Well, Part 23, 1337 tells us exactly what fuel gauges have to do. And this is where we get that perception of inaccuracy sometimes, because this is what most people cite when they say that fuel gauges are only required to read accurately when they are empty. Specifically, the, the regulation says that fuel gauges are required to read empty when the fuel level in that tank is at the lowest usable fuel level. But this is only one stipulation of 23.13.37. It's only one of a list of requirements for fuel gauge accuracy. The overriding discussion is that there, quote, there must be a means to indicate to the flight crew members the quantity of usable fuel in each tank during flight. An indicator calibrated in appropriate units and clearly marked to indicate those units must be used. And then in addition, it gives six different requirements that requirement to read accurately at the lowest unusable or lowest usable fuel level only being one of them. So the overriding regulation says you have to have accurate fuel gauges. Now, let's give you a list of specific things you need to include in that accuracy. And the perception that they're only accurate when they're empty can potentially lead us to distrust fuel gauge indications and consequently disregard them when they're telling us something we don't expect or don't want to read in flight. 
You also mentioned that there you've seen something different when you've been teaching in Australia. Tell us about that. Well, it is interesting. I've been I've been lucky to have spent quite a bit of time flying around with friends and beach products in Australia. And one of the thing I, things I noticed in their aircraft is that they uniformly have a calibration card posted next to the fuel quantity ages in the aircraft. And it will say, for example, at one half, it reads X number of liters, and at one quarter, it le- reads X number of liters. So it is, if you will, the fuel gauge equivalent of a compass correction card. The difference here is that it's something that we will use on every single flight. And I asked, I know a lot of, they call them uh, lamies down there, the engineers or the mechanics down there. I asked some of the engineers I know about that calibration and learned that this is actually a, a regular requirement for general aviation aircraft in Australia. Every three years, they have to have their fuel gauges recalibrated. So that suggests to me two things. Number one, that the fuel gauges are generally accurate across their entire range. And number two, if we bothered to maintain them, they can give us a high degree of uh, accuracy as to the actual fuel level in the tanks. The problem we have in the United States that leads to the distrust and dismissal of fuel gauge indications, in my opinion, is that there's no regulation in the U.S. that tells us we have to calibrate these things. And given the average age of a general aviation airplane, we've got an electric device that may be 40, 50, 60 years old. No wonder they are frequently inaccurate and we think we can't trust them. What about uh, rebuilding fuel gauges? What's the experience in the beach community? Well, there are really two components to the fuel indicating system in our aircraft, the display in the cockpit itself. And the sender or the transmitter or transmitters, in most cases, multiple ones, in the tanks. And the transmitters are are your basic float-type transmitter. As the fuel level changes, a float moves up and down, and that converts to an electric signal that goes to the indicating system in the cockpit. The two things, the two components have their own failure modes, of course. If something happens to one of the floats, if its actuator gets stuck or there is some sort of maybe you have a, a disruption to the wiring in them so that changes the the resistance to the float so you get an inaccurate. But if the float itself is, is damaged in some way, then it, it can be changed out. There's a, a very popular aftermarket provider, CIES in Oregon, that is used in a lot of beach airplanes. And our members love it. They say, hey, if I put these things in, suddenly these gauges are tremendously accurate. Well, if they had replaced or repaired the original gauges, they'd probably just be just as accurate as well. The second uh, component is the indication system in the cockpit. The indicators in at least the last 40 years of these airplanes are driven through a circuit board, a printed circuit board behind the panel. So the signal comes from the senders to the circuit board, and then that gets converted into a, an indication of the cockpit. The circuit board seem to be the weak link there, and there is an aftermarket supplier provider of repairs to those circuit boards. That uh, That's a very common repair in the older airplanes as well. Well, tell us about some of the other aftermarket things that are available and STCs that you can get, specifically in the Beach Bonanzas. Well, all of the, uh, the popular fuel monitoring systems are interfaceable with the float system and the circuit system. For example, the ABS Air Safety Foundation owns an A36 Bonanza 1981 model, and it's been retrofitted with the Garmin, a Garmin TXI panel and the uh, Garmin EIS, the engine information system, that has, among other things, a fuel totalizer function. We have the original style floats and senders in that airplane yet. The, the aftermarket folks actually have donated us a set, and at such time we need new ones, we'll put them in happily, but the, the current ones are very accurate. And when we made the switch from traditional gauges to the the EIS, I had some fuel indication issues, but it wasn't anything wrong with the existing, the original system. It was uh, just getting the the interface to work right. But all of the popular fuel monitors can interface with the floats in these airplanes and and give you very accurate information as well. So just go ahead, briefly explain the difference between fuel totalizer and, and fuel gauges so people understand the difference. Absolutely. And and that will lead back to the importance of of maintaining and and trusting your your fuel gauges as well. A fuel totalizer is an electronic device that measures the the rate at which or the amount of fuel that flows through a transducer on its way to combustion. 
And so depending on uh, whether it's carbureted or fuel injected and the design of the fuel injection system, that transducer will be some in some different location in the engine compartment. But it's going to be just prior to the point that the fuel gets distributed to the cylinders. And as the fuel flows through that, it, it, it creates an electrical signal that is converted to information in the cockpit that can be very, very accurate. So that tells you with extreme accuracy the amount of fuel that has flowed through that device in some period of time. If you are equally accurate in inputting the original fuel load into the totalizer, which is a manual input done by the pilot, then you have an extremely precise way of measuring how much fuel was burned by that engine or those engines. Fuel flow gauges are an excellent cross-check to totalizers because uh, totalizers only measure the fuel that go through that transducer. If you've got a fuel leak or some other situation where fuel is departing the fuel tanks but not going through the engine, a totalizer will not give you good information. As an example, just recently in the A-36, we had a very common uh, failure mode in these airplanes. The, the right wing, in this case, fuel cap, had a bit of a leak to it. There's a, there's a rubber seal in there, and as they age, they crack, and that allows uh, air to uh, pull the uh, fuel out in flight. And in this particular type of airplane, very consistently, one trip around the pattern, we, we had to do eight flight tests to finally get everything worked out right, but one trip around the traffic pattern will draw about five gallons of fuel through that tank. So fuel gets siphoned out at a very rapid rate. Guess what? Not a drop of that went through the transducer. So had I not noticed that I had a fuel cap leak, had I not seen this fine mist of fuel spraying out the wing, I would be very happy to take a long endurance trip in this aircraft, trusting my totalizer, when my fuel gauge would have, if it was accurate, would have shown an accurate reduction of fuel. In most cases, there are some failure modes where that won't work either, but they do provide a valuable cross-check to what the totalizer says. And I guess you do some other cross-checking routinely every time you fill up and things like that. Uh, Talk about what you do with fuel receipts and things like that. Well, you know, my best example of that is a job I had prior to coming here to the American Medansa Society. I worked for a company in Tennessee that had two Beechcraft Barons, and there were two of us who flew the airplane. So I routinely flew one, and and my boss routinely flew the other, but it was not terribly unusual to swap airplanes for one reason or another. And so I put together a protocol for verifying fuel loads. And we looked at all of the different ways to verify the fuel load. One, of course, is a visual check, which is the most accurate. Open up the fuel cap and look in there. However, in the beach airplanes, because of the wing dihedral, if the fuel load is less than about three quarters tanks, you can't see any fuel at all in there. You see the bottom of the bladder. So that's only as good as a total fuel level. There were times, you know, working for a a heavy construction company, sometimes you have to haul some heavy stuff. And so there are times when we wanted to have a reduced fuel level on these airplanes so we could carry more cabin payload. And in those cases, we cross-checked other ways. One of the airplanes had a a secondary visual display, uh, a float-type display on the top of the wing, so we could look at that. In both of the airplanes, we had totalizers, so we would cross-check the totalizers. We kept a written book, a little notebook, spiral notebook in each airplane where we recorded VOR checks and all that sort of stuff. And we also wrote down the the tap time and the amount of fuel put on board every time we added fuel to the aircraft. And then we had the cabin fuel gauges, the factory fuel gauges, and the totalizers themselves. So there were five or six different ways to check the fuel level. And the rule that we established, the protocol that we followed was that if any one of those indications, we checked them all before we flew the airplane, unless we could see the the fuel was full, we checked everything else. And if any one of those showed some unusual number or, or indicated something wildly different from the others, our only recourse was to put enough fuel in until we could visually check it and then start over. Wow, that's great. And I'm guessing you never had any fuel related accidents. No, we did not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't terribly important early on because both of those airplanes were early airplanes, early barons, and they had a really good, useful load. And more often than not, we fueled the air, uh, aircraft. But at one point, we traded two airplanes, two barons for a, a virtually new 1998 model at that point. And it had a significantly higher 
empty weight. So we found ourselves having to fly that airplane at reduced fuel loads quite a bit of the time. And we changed our rule. Instead of always topping off when you got back home, you never topped off until it was time to go. So it was very easy to make the transition to that aircraft, having already had years of experience with this protocol to check each other on our fuel loads. Do the modern current day Beechcraft that are being sold include low fuel level warnings such as have been included in the Cessnas since 1997? Yes. The uh, the low fuel monitoring system was added coincident with the introduction to G1000s, which was in the 2006 model year in these airplanes. Got it. And there was a point in time where Cessna said in a press release that there had not been a single fuel-related accident since they introduced the, that feature into the airplane. I love it. It's nice to have the warning come up and tell you, hey, one of those tanks has now dropped below a certain level. Yeah. You would mentioned my, my Flying Less- Lessons Weekly blog. And uh, one of the things I do that's, that goes along with that is what I call the Beach Weekly Accident Update. And I, I track trends and provide commentary uh, specific to the beach piston airplanes. And I noticed that very thing as well, that it took almost 10 years for a fuel-related mishap to affect one of the airplanes that had this G1000-based fuel monitoring, low-fuel monitoring system. Yeah, so I think something that people probably don't realize is these types of fuel accidents are far more likely to happen in aircraft that were built before the introduction of glass cockpits with their fuel totalizers, low fuel sensors, and uh, warnings, those kinds of things. And and in some cases, range rings that are based on totalizer indication and ground speed and such as well. That's great. Yeah, interestingly enough, through my weekly accident update, which I've been doing since 1998, I found that very, very consistently over the decades – about 90% of all reported engine failure accidents in Beach Bonanzas and Barrens are fuel starvation or fuel exhaustion events. In other words, if we could better monitor our fuel use in flight and the actual fuel we have, uh, fuel level we have based on uh, the combination of totalizer and old school indicating systems, we can eliminate 90% of all risk of engine failure in these aircraft. And at one point, I know that fuel-related accidents were somewhere around 11 12% of all accidents in the country. So, yeah, all you really need to do is pay a lot of attention to fuel-related issues, and suddenly you've just eliminated more than 10% of potential accidents. Yeah, you can get off on the uh, single versus twin discussion, and if you monitor your fuel properly, there's really – not much additional risk in the single engine airplane. We, you could get into the discussion with twins, and if you're competent to fly it and you stay trained, then obviously there's an increase in safety. But the the hazard presented by flying a single engine airplane is significantly reduced if you monitor your fuel properly. And as we start to wrap up here, any final thoughts on fuel gauges? Well, in short, it is possible to maintain fuel gauges, and if you maintain them properly, they can be extremely accurate. They provide a a very valuable cross-check to totalizer and and other fuel monitoring schemes and will give you a reality check if you have something like a fuel leak or a fuel cap siphoning event that wouldn't be recorded on a totalizer. The Australian experience proves that take these same pieces of equipment and calibrate them, and they can be extremely accurate and useful. Tom, thanks so much for sharing all this with us here today. Where do people find out more about you, your newsletter, and the American Bonanza Society? All right. Well, a couple of things. My my personal website is Mastery Flight Training with hyphens. So it's mastery-flight-training.com. And that's the home of Flying Lessons Weekly. You can subscribe free there and a few other things I have there as well. Of course, the American Bonanza Society supports over 10,000 members and is the largest Beechcraft owner community. We're at www.bonanza.org. Tom, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks for asking me. Now, during that conversation, Tom mentioned six different things that are required for fuel gauges, and I asked him to follow up with that, and he sent me this email, so I want to go ahead and give you this additional information. He says, The telling part isn't the list of six items that are part of fuel system design certification, but the overriding regulation, Regulation B, that states... There must be a means to indicate to the flight crew members the quantity of usable fuel in each tank during flight. He says the system that is required to read correctly only when it's empty would not meet this requirement that it display 
usable fuel level during flight. Here's the regulation, 23.1337B, power plant instruments installation. Fuel quantity indication, there must be a means to indicate to the flight crew members the quantity of usable fuel in each tank during flight. An indicator calibrated in appropriate units and clearly marked to indicate those units must be used. In addition, and it lists these six items, one, each fuel quantity indicator must be calibrated to read zero during level flight when the quantity of fuel remaining in the tank is equal to the unusable fuel supply determined under 23.959A. Two, each exposed sight gauge used as a fuel quantity indicator must be protected against damage. Three, each sight gauge that forms a trap in which water can collect and freeze must have means to allow drainage on the ground. Four, there must be a means to indicate the amount of usable fuel in each tank when the airplane is on the ground, such as by a stick gauge. Five, tanks with interconnected outlets and air spaces may be considered as one tank and need not have separate indicators. And six, no fuel quantity indicator is required for an auxiliary tank that is used only to transfer fuel to other tanks if the relative size of the tank, the rate of fuel transfer, and operating instructions are adequate to, one, guard against overflow, and two, give the flight crew members prompt warning if transfer is not proceeding as planned. And he says that 23.2430 states, A, each fuel system must, four, provide the flight crew with a means to determine the total usable fuel available and provide uninterrupted supply of the fuel when the system is correctly operated, accounting for likely fuel fluctuations. Tom, thanks so much for the follow-up on that. Coming up next, listener feedback with stories of listener close calls. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Here's an email from listener Mark Nockenhauer. He says, Hi, Max. Your recent show on fuel starvation hit home. I had one incident and know the pilots of two others. My personal one was that I was flying from Placerville to Mariposa and back. That's here in California. The flight south went well. I stopped at Mariposa. I then started to head back home to uh, Placerville. And 15 minutes after takeoff, I was scanning the gauges when I noticed the left tank gauge read empty. That was a heart-stopping moment, but fortunately the gauge started reading the correct fuel quantity about five minutes later. That was the last time I took off without doing a walk around even for a short stop. Second incident involved a friend, I'll call him Mr. E. He had property in Arizona, would top off his tanks in western Arizona, and fly north to Sacramento to the maximum range of his tanks without reserves. Weather and winds were not in his favor, and he and his wreckage were found the next day. Third one involved a CFI from the FBO I rented from. He borrowed a Cessna 210 from the FBO, flew from Placerville to Reno, then on to Watsonville without doing a pre-flight, ran out of fuel after a go-around when he was cut off by another pilot in the pattern. He blamed it on the pilot that cut him off. Yeah, think about that. That, uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And another one he said did not actually happen. I was killing some time and drove out to Sierraville Airport and met a pilot there that was getting ready to depart for Nevada City. We talked about flying and he mentioned that he only had five gallons of fuel in a Cessna 150 and he thought it would be just enough to get to Nevada City if he flew straight there. I pointed out that he'd be flying into rising terrain. He would be pushing his luck to make it, telling him it would be safer to fly to Nervino, get some gas, then head home. And I did mention how I had lost a friend to fuel starvation. The pilot took off for Novino, which is only about 15 miles away. Well, thanks so much for that, Mark. And here's the email that was sent to Rob Mark. The listener wishes to remain anonymous. He says, I'm currently listening to the Aviation News Talk podcast, where you and Max were talking about VFR into IMC and icing. Thought I'd entertain you a bit with my one icing story. This was about my fifth cross-country flight in IMC after getting my IFR rating. He said, there are mountains three to 4,000 feet all around us, and I was definitely an IMC. I filed southbound and everything went fine, landed, met with my client, and went back to the FBO to look at the weather and file my northbound flight. There was a cloud layer at 5,000 feet and icing forecast at 8,000 with another layer, so I filed for 7,000. Departed and climbed out through the first layer. That was a non-event. Once it cruised between layers, I could see a long ways to the north, so I was confident of the planning. However, the outside air temperature was very close to zero degrees. 
After about 20 minutes, I looked at the outside air temperature sensor that was sticking out above the pilot's windscreen and noticed a slight buildup, just perhaps about an eighth of an inch of ice, but it got my attention. But in the next minute, the entire windscreen almost instantly froze over, literally eliminated my forward visibility. Came out of nowhere. I immediately got an instruments and turned to tell my wife in the right seat that we were going back as we were picking up ice. In the 15 seconds it took me to say those words, she pointed to the attitude indicator, and I was in a hard right bank. Did not feel it at all in the seat of the pants. I corrected to straight and level and immediately did a 180, staying hard on the instruments, knowing I had hard pointy things, mountains of course, 3,000 feet below me. Once turned around, I then contacted Approach and told them what I did. I did not wait to contact them, ask for Approach, get approval, and then initiate the 180. I told them I was picking up ice and was ascending and returning. ATC asked if I was declaring an emergency. I said no, just need to get down direct to the destination. The controller's voice told me he was pissed as they have sometimes commercial traffic going into that airport. He turned one airplane and as I was getting into VFR, he cleared me direct to the airport. I dropped down to about 5,500 feet and the ice vanished as fast as it froze over. Landed safely, spent the night, came home the next morning IFR in decent weather. So based on what you guys were saying in the podcast, did I do the right thing to get out of an unsafe situation and then ask permission? Whole thing was two minutes from icing to clearance direct to the airport, so do not think that I caused too much of a ruckus. I did, however, live to tell you this tale. It was also my last IFR trip, not because I was scared, because we sold the airplane and I never flew a long IFR trip in it again. Well, and just to answer his question, technically he should have notified ATC before he made the 180. On the other hand, if he were to declare an emergency after having made a 180, uh, then there wouldn't be any issue with him not asking permission before he turned. But yes, ideally, you always want to notify ATC before you make a 180. But frankly, if there's an emergency, don't worry about it. Make your turn and as quickly as possible, declare the emergency. Here's an email from Helen Woods. She says, Max, I enjoyed your latest episode today, but did want to make one comment. Whether intended or not, your discussion about weather-related accidents gave the impression that they are just something that low-time pilots need to worry about. I think far too many reports out there give this impression. And Helen, that's a really good point. That was certainly not my intent. High-time pilots also get into weather-related accidents. It just seems that so many of the ones that, to me, are, are so moving are folks who have low time and perhaps just didn't know better and got killed because they got into it. Uh, Helen continues, after his retirement from being a... Naval aviator and test pilot, Scott Crossfield became a well-known and well-loved GA pilot here in the D.C. area. Everyone was shocked when he died in that thunderstorm in 2006. I don't know if you recall, but there was a lot of discussion about whose fault it was, his or the controllers, for him flying into a storm. This was in the early days of XM and before ADSB, and he did not have weather on his aircraft. He did, though, ask the controller to vector him around weather, but that request had been to a prior controller previous to the one that was working him when he flew into the storm. AOPA did a multi-page spread about who did what and whose responsibility it was to do what, and pretty much the entirety of the discussion of the accident revolved around that, probably because no one could imagine a pilot as experienced as Scott Crossfield making rookie mistakes. I didn't think anything more about it until several years later at Air Venture, when I was at one of Rod Machado's seminars when Rod told the story, and let the other shoe drop that had been completely missed by AOPA and other press sources. The day of the accident was Mr. Crossfield's wedding anniversary. He was down in the Carolinas, and his wife was back home in Virginia. There was a TFR scheduled for later that day at the airport where he was staying. Had he not left at that time, he would have been trapped by the TFR and not made it home for his anniversary. I think it's very important when discussing weather to make sure every pilot listening understands that these lessons are for everyone. Time and experience does not make you immune to the types of pressures that mix so poorly with weather. Helen, thank you so much for that email, and I totally agree with you. Uh, Weather-related accidents happen to all of us. No matter how good a pilot we are or how many hours we have, we need to consistently make good decisions on every single flight, and that involves weather as well, too. And just a quick reminder, back in early September, I said we had about 360 patrons. I'd love your help to get up to 400 by the end of the year. Well, we're getting there. We've got 371, though. I know we're going to lose some here at the beginning of the month. So if you haven't done so already, please go on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome or aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal and sign up to support the show. 
And finally, please tell all of your friends about the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, just send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store because there they can download our dedicated app for free. It's really, really easy to do that. Just tell them to search in the store for Aviation News Talk. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>